How have you been then? You've been all right, mate? Not not too bad, thanks. Yeah, just uh, trying to get on with things like everybody else. Yeah. Teaching yeah. kids from home every now and again. Yeah. Never thought I'd be doing that. <laughs> yeah, so it's always a bit fun, isn't it? That I, like, I had to build a beanstalk over the weekend out of toilet rolls. <laughs> <laughs> Not had to do anything like that, yeah. I enjoyed it. <laughs> oh, it's, like, it's better than my real job. <laughs> Right, if it's all right, Liam, we'll uh, we'll get straight on with it. Yeah, of course, yeah. Cool. So, if it's all right, I just want to start right at the beginning of your your career with Arsenal, and with I think you was a graduate there, wasn't you as well? Yes, what, yeah, yeah. What was it like being part of such a massive sort of youth setup, probably one of the world's best? Um, it, it was brilliant. I mean, looking back now, I appreciate it a lot more. Um, not, not that I didn't at the time, but you don't realise what you've got. Um, we had the best coaches. We had um, Don Howe from like 16 till I was like 19, I think. Um, you know, managed Arsenal, been involved with England a few times. Um, it, it was just everyone that surrounded the club was, had some sort of high profile. So head of youth development was Liam Brady. Um, obviously, Wenger was the, was the manager there, but... Um, at the time they were trying to bring through like Paul Davis and stuff as coaches and Steve Bowles so um, it, it was brilliant you get tra- treated fantastically um, but it just seems normal that, that's that's yeah. the problem <laughs> yeah yeah I suppose I wonder if players sort of appreciate that more if, if they go the other way and sort of come up through the yeah the I, and get I, I, I think I think you would Um I mean, I I was always quite grounded. That's one thing I always tried to be. I didn't want to yeah. try and think I was better than I ever was. I wasn't that type of player. But, um, you know, you went out on loan to... I went to Northampton, I think, maybe when I was about 20, 19, 20. Mm. And it was a different world. But we'd been brought up in such a way that, you know, we were able to play at whatever level and any style we were, you know, we had to play at. But it was good. I remember coming back and I had uh, Eddie Novetsky at the time was the reserve team manager. And he just, I think he asked me in front of everybody else, what, what's, what was the difference? And I said, everybody, everybody's playing to pay their mortgage. Yeah. And you, didn't have, you didn't have that at Arsenal. But, you know, at League One, League Two, players did want their bonuses because it made the difference between having, having a, a bit more spending money or being able to pay everything they needed to. And, and I, I think that's something that gets missed now. I think everybody, everybody thinks every player's on a million pounds a year or more, and it's it's not the case. Yeah. <laughs> really like Every player we've had on who maybe started out with a massive club, they've all said that exact pretty much to the word, what you have there, where the difference going from, like, I remember when Ben Formley was at Man United and he went to Huddersfield and there's other oh, players... Yeah. Off the top of my head, I'm struggling to think of now. But Lee were one, weren't he? he? Went from United. Tommy Lee, yeah, he went from United to Ch- uh, was it Macclesfield? Yeah. Macclesfield, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and they all say that like so you're getting pinned up in dressing room because for win bonuses, that yeah, that fucking error was a re- it was a joke that my win bonus and he did that to pay me bills yeah. and stuff. And I, th- I think that is probably totally lost, especially now when you've got the Chelsea youth team, probably the Arsenal youth team too, earning five to ten k. If not more, probably at, at that age now, it's probably crazy different. Yeah, I mean, it's I, I can't I can't ever complain what I earned there, but it, it wasn't wasn't anywhere near what people would think it is because yeah. they just see at the time Dennis Bergkamp or ever Thierry Henry thinking that's what you know everybody earns at the club. <laughs> <laughs> but I can tell you, it wasn't, and um, <laughs> it, it was just yeah, like I said, it's, it's eye opening to go to. A, to another club and, and see those things and like I said see people's reactions because it does mean so much to them not not that they love football but with with, with football it, it brings you the ability to to have a better life um yeah so especially lower down where you really have to fight for it but yeah like I said the youth team lads now um I've heard stories of boys on like 14 grand a week yeah. Never played a first team game, went on loan to a League Two team, and they sent him back and said he won't make it as a footballer. He got <laughs> fourteen grand a week. So he, he was, you know, if, as long as he's looked after his money, he's pretty much set himself up there. As long as he doesn't 
yeah. mess things up massively. Yeah. So I, I'd take it, right? If I was, yeah. if I was there now, <laughs> I'd take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It so, is, oh, go on. Sorry, Josh. No, I was just going to say, you, you wonder if that might be why players maybe lose the hunger because when there's that much money involved, you know, like you say, league, league one, league two, you're fighting for that win. You're fighting to get a better contract, to pay your mortgage, to pay your bills. If you're on 14 grand a week at 18 and you've never made a first team appearance, do you, do you care if you win? Probably not. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think, like you said, if, if they've not sort of brought the kids up correctly in the youth teams and yeah. grounded them, um, I think now there's a big thing about trying to get, deliberately give kids setbacks mm. so they know what it's like. Um, but I don't think it's anything different as to ever what's been done before. I remember reading something about Bergkamp and Ajax deliberately dropped him from like an under-18s to go and play for the under-16s right. because they wanted to see a reaction from him. Yeah. And, and he did. He went down and he did what he had to and, and he was straight back again. But yeah. Some lads can't do that. And then I started to see it towards the end of my career as, as boys came through that the resilience gone. It, it wasn't there. They, they, they couldn't take being shouted at. Yeah. They'd, they'd almost like well up. They'd go into their shells. And it, yeah, it, it changed. But I think every footballer, <laughs> every 10, 15 years, I think will say the same thing. Oh, football's changed. Football's gone. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it's, um, it's, it's evolving all the time. But football ultimately doesn't change. The, the actual game you're playing doesn't change. You yeah. still can see goals the same way, score them the same way. Yeah. Um, it's just the whole mindset thing and mm. tackling in particular at the minute does my head in. <laughs> but you people just can't tackle anymore. Like, no. I, I was in Mane last night. I know he caught him with his foot, but yeah. a few yeah. years ago, that was a good challenge. He's, he's won yeah. the ball and he's taken the player. It's uh, just, like I said, it just shows that it changes very quickly. But... Yeah. Uh, I don't think I'd have been on the pitch very long now. <laughs> <laughs> um, on your Arsenal career, then Liam. Obviously, before you left, I'm just wondering what it was like in training. Did you, from your perspective, did you get the opportunity to go up against the likes of God for that period? What Henri, Perez, Vieira, Bergkamp? What were they like? Yeah. Did they ever inter interact with you? And what was what was yeah. that like? Uh, it, again, it, it's brilliant looking back now. Um, I, 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 you know, I was. Lucky to a degree to, to have you know, been there and, and been involved with those players, especially when they were at a time when they were so successful. Um, but yeah, for, for a period of time, I I was training with, with the first team, and um, it was it was a brilliant experience. The, the lads were all good. I, I can't couldn't say any of them were out of order or anything like that. They never sort of looked down on you uh, in any way. Um, it, it was it was brilliant. Like I said, you had Omri, you had Burkamp. From my point of view, Tony Adams was there, Keown was there, yeah. Sol Campbell sort of came towards the end as I was leaving. Um, but yeah, it, it was it was brilliant to go in there and test yourselves with those those sorts of players. And uh, yeah, something I look back look back on fondly. Um, but yeah, it's only seems like yesterday. The more the more you think about it. <laughs> It feels like you're still 18, but unfortunately I'm not. Had another 20 years on top of it. Uh, you're close, but no, it was brilliant. And like I said, all the lads were willing to, to try and help you. Um, it, it was fantastic, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, amazing. Oh, that's amazing. So from Arsenal, then you did join Colchester after a successful loan spell. What was what was sort of your reasoning behind leaving Arsenal? Did you want to go out and get? Cause I know you had a couple of loans and. And whatnot previously. Did you want to go out and sort of become a first team regular and settle down somewhere? Yeah, I, I think, like I said, my first loan was Northampton, and and I really enjoyed that. I only went for a month, but it was over Christmas, so I played played around about eight games or something like that. Um, and you just get a taste for it. Then you, you want to be in first team football, and then you get used to playing it. And then when you come back to the reserves, that then you just you're not happy to see things go wrong. So I remember we played Chelsea and, and I think it was a left back at the time made two, the same mistake twice. It cost us goals twice. And for some reason, Pat Rice had taken the game that day and he was trying to like talk him round and, you know, you, you've done well, son. Oh, well, he's not good enough. He's made two, two, the same mistake twice. It cost us two goals. 
And I think within a few days, I was out on loan again. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then that, yeah, I mean, I love going out on loan. I, I, I did. It, it, I gained something from it every time. Um, and like you said, when, when it came to it, um, I could have actually gone to the season before, I could have gone to Northampton permanently or Colchester permanently. Yeah. Uh, there was a little bit of messing around with the Northampton deal. Um, my agent at the time had got another player in on the back of me and said, you're only getting him if you yeah. sign this player as well. Yeah, okay. Then when I looked at the contract, he was earning twice the commission he should have been earning. Mm -hmm. And I actually signed the contract at Northampton. Yeah. And I was due to go out to um, America after a pre-season game. I sat and watched the game and it basically all went tits up. Yeah. <laughs> I sat there and I thought, no, this isn't right. People are taking money they shouldn't be taking. Yeah. I felt a bit pressured into it. Like the, the agent wanted me to go more than anything. Um, and I had to walk out on the pitch after the game to uh, the manager at the time, it was Martin. I can't think what his second name was. And uh, he was absolutely brilliant. Mm. He said, I understand why you're doing it. You know, you've got to do what's right for you. The chairman, on the other hand, he didn't like it. He called <laughs> me a greedy, greedy bastard and this and that. But he never, he never knew what the actual truth was. It wasn't that yeah. I, I did it, I thought, for the right reasons, which is I was being pressured into it and people were making money they shouldn't be making. Yeah. Um, and then it came, well, it's good, I couldn't really go back to Arsenal. I could have trained, but things move quickly and you're out the, wind, out the picture. So Phil Parkinson came in and said, do you want to come here on for, a, for a season loan? So I said, yeah, jumped at the chance, loved it. I was out of contract at the end of that season and then I signed uh, permanent, permanently for two years. And uh, mm. it was a great time to go because there was myself, there was uh, Richard Garcia went there, uh, Craig Fagan, mm. uh, Yatesy, Andrew Yates. We had George Alacobi and Greg Halford. And okay. we, we, had, we had a really good squad. Mm. I think pretty much every single one of us went on to play at least championship and, mm. a, and a few played premiership. So... Um, no, it was, a, it was a great time to be there. We got promoted. And, uh, yeah, that was um, that sort of got me back on track. That's what sort of got me used to playing football properly as, as a man, really, uh, week in, week out. So, no, it was great. I really, I really enjoyed the time at Colchester. And Jamie Kira and the the lower league, Thierry Henry, we've used it yeah. before. Like 20 yeah. goals, didn't he, I think? Yeah, Kuro turned up on loan initially, I think, the, the year I left. Um, he was a great lad. He scored, scored plenty of goals. We had Chris Ibalumu, and obviously the yeah. the season they the first season of the championship. I left that season, went to Preston, mm. but that was the year that uh, Chris and Curo did did really well. Um, and I think we we went there and we lost. I think if we'd have got a draw or one, we would have got in the playoffs. <laughs> um, but it was just just one of those things. But. No, I mean, I, I still look out for the results now, Colchester. It was um, a bit different, new ground and stuff now, but um, it, it was still a, still a club I look out for and I, I really enjoyed my time while I played there. Yeah. What makes your mind upon then signing for Colchester? I know you say you was out of contract and you sort of you was there on a the season loan before. Do you get the sort of vibe from the manager as well, like Phil Parkinson, like a bit of sort of guiding you and sort of showing you a bit of love as a player type thing to come in or is it just you want to get that first team football? Yeah, I think I think with Phil in particular, that was his first management job. Mm -hmm. um, he, he was young himself. He probably was. He didn't, he, I don't think he knew this. I played against him when he was a player. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just remember this fellow with a gum shield in playing at Reading. <laughs> <laughs> he used to he did a lap of the pitch before the game clapping all the fans and he just ran around the pitch like an absolute loony um, <laughs> but he ended up being my manager um, I don't think he ever knew I played against him but he, I liked him I, I, I know he's recently lost a job at Sunderland and stuff yeah. but he's got a way that he wants to play and if everybody in the squad takes it on board it'll work yeah. and I think that's where he struggled when he was in the championship and things like that. You end up with players who've played at higher levels um, 
who maybe didn't have to go down the leagues to come back up and then they didn't didn't want to do the running and they didn't want to stick their heads in and yeah. Phil just wanted that commitment and uh, I think that's ultimately sort of it was his downfall of a few clubs but for, for me personally he said he, he wanted me there he liked me as a player I'd enjoyed the time there financially Colchester were never going to offer massive money because they couldn't they, they, they weren't a big club so that wasn't ever really an issue um, and I was from Chelmsford originally so it was 15 miles down the road, something like that. So um, to start with, I could commute from my mum and dad's and then, then I bought a flat in Chelmsford. So um, yeah, it was on my doorstep to a degree <laughs> and I knew they had a good squad uh, and at the time, the manager as well. So yeah, it was, it was an easy decision for me. Um, and it basically said, if, if you're fit and you're playing well, you'll start. So yeah, that was that was a bonus. That, as well. that is, yeah. <laughs> I think he's just been unlucky, Phil Parkinson, really, when you look at, the clubs he's gone into, they seem like Sunderland and Bolton. He's gone to some clubs in an absolute state, hasn't he? He did well at Bradford, didn't he, as well? So, yeah, yeah, yeah he, the ability. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like you said, he's, he's done well at some clubs and other ones. Yeah. There's been bad situations around him when he's taken over or, or when he's left um, financially. But, yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I never had a, a problem playing, playing for Phil. You, he set out every player on the pitch and said, this is the bare minimum I want from you. Mm-hmm. Give me that and I'm happy. Yeah. And obviously when you get to a standard where you can do that week in, week out, then you can start to add things to it. And, and like I said, we had a good team. We had like Neil Dans and Kev Watson was playing in there. Um, like I said, we had Richard Garcia, Doogie, um, who'd been at Colchester all his career. He, he was a good player. Um, so it was, yeah, one of them where I think we got the recruitment was good. I think their scouts and stuff were very good. Mm-hmm. They were able to pick up free transfers um, and they knew the lads. They knew that they had the right characters and I think that's what ultimately uh, got us promoted that season. Yeah. I think there might be something in that, Luke, where you're saying sort of he's, he's not done amazingly well at the sort of bigger, poorly run clubs, your Boltons and your Sunderlands. Because they're probably signing wrong players. They're probably signing these players who, who have been at higher level and they might not want to do that that dirty work like yeah. you said. Or some like yeah. just always go for names, won't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. In League yeah. One. But yeah. yeah. A, a cook, at the end of the day, I think that, if I might be wrong in saying this, but off the top of my head, I'd, I'd say it's probably right, but I think that's probably Colchester's most successful period in their history, I, I think. think. I don't know if they've yeah. been championship before or after, but... No, the, the, I think that was the first time... Yeah. I'd say it was the first I think the first time they got, first time they got to the championship, I think. Um, I think it was, yeah. Yeah, and that, I mean that first season they did brilliantly. Started badly, but did finish really well. Uh, second season they started to lose players. Yeah, it was, it was easy pickings for teams. They knew the lads weren't on big money. They knew the club would take offers on players. So, um, yeah, like I said, ultimately, I reckon all eleven of, of the of the of the team, the starting eleven went on to play at least championship level at other clubs as well. So no, it was yeah, def- definitely the most successful time. Was that when they signed Teddy Sheringham, or have I made that up? He went. Yeah, to- they, oh, they, yeah, they did, didn't they? Yeah, they did. Yeah, they <laughs> they signed him um, the first year in the championship. I think it was. Yeah. He didn't um, I didn't think he did too bad either. I'm sure he scored a few goals. Only about yeah, forty eight. He, he did. <laughs> he did. He did well, I think. Um, and again, I was I used to speak to the lads, and they all used to say he was brilliant. Mm. No, no, no airs and graces. He came in, he worked hard, he helped lads out. Um, and like I said, ultimately, he, he did well on the pitch for him as well. So um, that was a, it was a great signing for him. And I, mm. I, I don't know whether maybe Kev Watson had something to do with that because um, he knew him from Tottenham. Um, mm. And then I think when he took over at Stevenage, he took Kev as his assistant. So, so he must have known him quite well, I think. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think think Kev Kevin probably had a bit of a helping hand with that one. <laughs> so we have touched on it then. The promotion season with Colchester up into the championship. How was that like for a player and sort of the celebrations at the end of the season? Yeah, it, it was uh, it was brilliant. I mean, it went right right down to the wire. Um, we had to get, I think we had to get a point away at Yeovil to to cement second place. Um, 
as it was, Brentford, I think, ended up losing that day. So even if we'd have lost, we still would have gone up. Yeah. Um, but that was a long, one of the longest 90 minutes of football I'd ever, <laughs> ever played. It was. It just felt like like the Alamo. It was just, they were coming at us all the time. We were just heading and kicking everything. Like just, just wanted the game to finish. But um, the, the Colchester fans filled the away end. Absolutely rammed it was. Um, yeah. And yeah, afterwards the celebrations were great. You know, I had, had a few drinks on the bus, and um, I think we went out into Colchester afterwards. Um, and then a few. Few few days later, we did like an open top bus thing. That that was good. Yeah. Um, as much as we didn't think there'd be many people, there what there actually was. It, it was good. We went to the town hall and met the mayor and everything. So no, it was a it was a brilliant experience. Um, and like you said, for for a club of that size, it was never expected. So that was that was one thing we because <laughs> we never expected to go up. The bonuses never got put on the league. <laughs> <laughs> They always got put in the FA Cup and, and leagues, League Cup and stuff like that. So um, we got promoted and I played 30 odd games that season. And I got something like 1,800 quid after tax. <laughs> we getting promoted to the Championship. <laughs> Bloody hell. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, we went to a wedding in Mauritius that year. We got, got, we got to the airport and I thought, I'll upgrade us. So my now wife. I basically spent my whole promotion bonus on upgrading us one way to Mauritius. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I so, all, um, sorry, Nick. I just wondered because them games like that where it's end of season and you know, I mean, there might be two teams either fighting to go up or to go down. You always see fans, don't you? Now they're checking on the phone, but you used to have like radio to your ear and that. Did you yeah. see that in that game? We we like what what Brentford doing or? I imagine managers like we do our we do our game. Don't worry about worry about that. But fans are always trying to come up with new chance, don't they? One nil. Yeah, I, I think I think we were getting I think we were getting the scores from from the fans. I think, um, but obviously, like you said, it, second half we were shooting towards the away fans, mm. so we couldn't really hear them. Um, yeah. But like you said, a few of the lads would be saying like, oh. This is happening. That's happening. Um, but the other thing was like the time. That always annoyed me. No one would ever tell you how long you had left. <laughs> so you could you could have had thirty seconds left. You just didn't know because yeah. everybody's wrapped up in it and just overexcited to the point where you need a level head just to say like thirty seconds left. Just yeah. stick it in the corners and get off the pitch, sort of thing. But um, no, it, it was brilliant. It was a great, great group of lads. Um, and I, we went to Marbella at the end of that. That that summer, they took us to Marbella as a bit of a, you know, a thank you for it and a congratulations. Mm. It was, uh, yeah, that was a good few days we had out there as well. Finally, <laughs> Parkinson or someone else had just shouted on, "Don't worry, they're losing anyway." Then he could have also <laughs> got got your uh, got your sandals on already and just kicked back. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's the danger, isn't it? If, if yeah. you're relying on <laughs> sort of thinking, "Oh, we don't have to do anything now." There's always that chance with football; it will swing the result and go the other way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, th I think we did it the right way, just getting on with our game, trying yeah. to yeah. trying to do what we had to do. So uh, yeah, all worked all worked out right. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose a perfect example of that is the Man United Man City incident and last minute Aguero. Sorry, Josh, I know you're not going to like that one, but <laughs> I'm never forget so we don't without mentioning that. <laughs> Phil Jones's face is it away at Sunderland when he's like yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <"Clap."> <laughs> so in that in that summer then after you've just got promotion you head out to Preston how does that come about for a player to sort of know that there's a deal on the table for you to sort of go and move over to another club um, I'd I was on a, I was on a Bosman I was on a free transfer um, and I I have to look at it and, I, and I, I sort of think Colchester did it as if to say, look, you, you've helped us out. We're going to do you a bit of a favour. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't offer me anything until after the deadline when, when I could then start speaking to them or, or seeing what it was about. Um, but it wasn't actually until pre-season had started that uh, I ended up going to Preston. Mm -hmm. um, there was a few clubs and unfortunately... <laughs> Every other one got promoted to the Premiership except Preston. <laughs> um, 
there was Hull made an offer, um, and I was willing to accept it. Mm. But then they put a transfer embargo on Phil Parkinson taking any players from Colchester. All right, okay. Which, if I was going to argue the toss, I'm pretty sure I could have gone to court and said, well, that's stopping me earning yeah. a living. But yeah, yeah. you haven't got time to do that, have you? So um, that got put by the wayside just because I wasn't able to do it. Um, and then there, I was left with Stoke, Preston and Burnley. Mm. You didn't come to Burnley, um, Liam. What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> Burnley fan. It it never it never materialised. It was it was one of them where I just seemed to be waiting and waiting, and then I got an offer from Preston, which was the same money Colchester had offered. They just said, "Look, come up. We'll give you the same deal. See how it goes." They'd done brilliant out last three seasons. I think they'd done really well in two of them. I just thought, yeah. Let's have a crack at that, um, yeah. and it ended up, ended up working out for me. I played every league game bar one, um, so I played forty nine games, I think, in total that season, um, and, and got a new contract off the off the back of that. Um, so no, I love my time up there. I, I still live close to it now. I live about fifteen miles away, so mm. I've got married, two kids, and and still go and watch them, do a bit of commentary every now and again. So uh, no. I, Really, really, really enjoy the time, Preston. Yeah, I, th- I think that's always quite interesting, isn't it? About the sort of close call moves that you can sort of who was it? I think it was Martin Carruthers, weren't it? Who was saying about he had rumours to be going to a couple of different clubs, but yeah. has there ever been one where it's been quite a close call like you've nearly signed from other than the Northampton one? There was, like I said, that when I went to left Colchester, there was a few clubs interested. Then, whilst I was at Preston, there was West Brom, apparently, mm. wanted me and St. Ledger. Mm. Um, we played them twice that season and we played well both times, uh, like me and Ledge. Um, and they, they wanted both of us, I think. Um, but, again, that, that, for whatever reason, and, and this is the problem, as a, as a player, you don't know what's going on. Um, when, when I was at Arsenal, West Brom wanted to sign me. Mm. They wanted to sign me and John Halls. Right. We were bo- we were both with the same agent, and the same agent who was trying to rip me off. Um, he wanted two agency fees rather than one for doing the deals, and it fell through. West Brom wouldn't do it, wow. but the club, the agents, never told me until I left them. So mm. yeah, so I would have been nineteen, maybe twenty. So I could have gone from there to, I think Megson was manager, could have gone and worked under Megson and who knows what would have happened, but it didn't come about. And then at Preston, I was doing well. Irvine came in and I was doing well under Irvine. And I thought I snapped my Achilles at Charlton in the March, I think it was. And Chris Kamara was in the players' lounge before the game telling everybody who was listening, this lad's going places, and blah, blah, blah. And and I know that there was uh, now a, a very financially struggling Northwest club, we were in the Prem at the time, right. um, who wanted, who were saying, end of the season, we'll, we'll make a bid. Yeah. I snapped me Achilles in March and it oh, never, wow. never materialised. <laughs> but that's, that's football. That's what happens. So yeah, it's not, not a great deal you can do. Yeah. Oh, what, <clears throat> With that Preston team, obviously, they had, off the top of my head, Nugent, David Nugent, uh, Sean St. Ledger, like you say. Simon Whaley, he was always a player that played well against yeah. Yeah. I don't know what happened really to him, but you had a good side. And it always shocked me, you never quite, and that's not just from your seasons there, Liam, but even like the ones before and after, they've never quite made that step. Was there anything you feel like we're lacking in the team at all, or...? Um, Everyone around was, Preston has, has has done it, and they've not been better teams. Like Burnley, when we first went up and growing coil, we weren't a better team. We just maybe had a bit of luck. Yeah, Blackpool even far smaller. Yeah. No, it was like I said, our, our team was good. We had first season we had uh, Carlo Nash in goal. Yeah, we had uh, mm-hmm. Matty Hill and Callum Davidson left backs. Me Ledge, um, Mawini was injured that season, so he didn't. He didn't play. Um, Graham Alexander, Simon Whaley, Paul McKenna, 
we had Danny Dickey on Brett Orman Rod there as well <clears throat> um, we had a little winger Louis Neal he used to come on and, and, and he, he was a good player um, we, we did yeah like I said we had Nugent as well we had a good a, I would say a very good start in 11 mm-hmm. we didn't particularly have strength in depth I mean to be fair we, we actually had Kelvin Wilson there <laughs> and and the gaffer decided he didn't like him and got rid of him. Um, he did all right for himself, going to Celtic, and, and yeah. I think he probably proved the gaffer wrong with that one. But um, but he used to play right back, centre back. He was a good he was a good player. Patrick Adjiman as well. Mm-hmm. He was like the quickest thing you'd seen on two legs. He was unbelievable. Um, he'd come off the bench and absolutely shit you up with his pace. He was oh, he was unbelievable. He yeah. could just. I remember pre season we were doing these sprint things like to cones and back. He lapped, he, he lapped people. He, he was like one <laughs> ahead of everybody. He was that quick. Um, but no, like I said, we, we had a good, they were a good group of lads, had a good 11, 12, 13 players. And then it came to Christmas and we really needed to invest some money. Mm. Derby were doing it. But they, they were buying players that weren't necessarily all round great players. They were just filling holes that were going to help. Yeah. Um, and we signed. Who did we sign? The lad who played with Bolton uh, made one England appearance. Michael. Oh, Ricketts. Ricketts. Oh, yeah. Oh, we had him at Burnley. Um, he was gash at Burnley. Sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. Sorry. <laughs> I think we signed him on a free transfer. We signed a lad, Pavel, um, from uh, Eastern European country. He, he was a good player. He did play in the Champions League and stuff. Um, but we just didn't. We didn't get the right players. Um, and then we ended up missing out on goal difference, I think, from the playoffs. But we were top of the top of the league at Christmas. Mm-hmm. Um, it, 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 yeah, it just felt like when we really needed it, that little bit of money spending, they, they couldn't do it or they weren't willing to do it. Um, yeah. And ultimately, it's uh, it cost them. But it's you look at them now, and they're one of the few clubs that financially are secure. I know they've got like a billionaire owning them, but um, they're, they're, they're pretty self-sufficient, I think. They have to sell players every, every now and again, I think, to clear the debts. But um, no, the, the, it was a good setup, and, and at some point they should get into the premiership. Hopefully I'll see uh-huh. it. <laughs> yeah. That's I mean, bring that rivalry back, won't it, Luke? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, there'll be some Burnley fans might watch this and think, what are you saying? We hate Preston. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I miss that derby. It, we had some amazing games. It was never nil nil Burnley Crest. It was always like three two, four three. I remember they batted yeah. five three once at Deepdale. And the, I would say probably the biggest club never to play in the Premier League at this point. They must be up there. I would have thought. Yeah. I can't think of anyone else that fits that criterion. Um, no, they're, they're, they're a massive club. Like I said, yeah. the, the derbies with Burnley were were brilliant. I think I played in one that was either four three or three two. Ledge scored an own goal, which oh yeah, I remember that. Uh, <laughs> Win Andy Gray, <laughs> Andy Gray, that's it. Yeah, um, but no, we had we had some good, good games there. But that was another one. You know, where we were saying about you didn't know how long was left. Yeah, and we got it back level. And I remember running to go and get the ball to take a throw in because I wanted to go and win the game. I'm thinking, no, you're playing a local derby probably like 80 something minutes should have just been leaving the ball and taking your time but that was just you get caught up in the emotion and uh, yeah. that, was a, that was a good game and another time we played I think we beat, beat you know, Mel's might have scored a penalty or something um, and I ended up having <laughs> you had a lad sent off and you had Akin Bailly on the bench and the big goalkeeper what was his name? Brian uh, Jensen yes they came on the, <laughs> they came on the pitch when when the referee was sending the lad off, and I got a bit involved, heat of the moment, telling them telling them where to go, and what I was going to do. <laughs> uh, it sort of when when you sober up a bit from it, you go, Christ, what have I done there? And uh, luckily, Louis Neal knew Addy from Stoke. Yeah, and Addy come out after the game <laughs> during the cool down, and he thought. Chris Sedgwick was me and he went for Chris Sedgwick and Chris Sedgwick 
very quickly pointed his finger and went, I've got job as he is. And, <laughs> like and he came over. And I thought, I'm either going to have to like go to toe to toe with him here or go have to think of something. And he just started telling me what he was going to do and how he was going to rip my head off and this and that. And I just went, yeah, mate, you probably would. <laughs> he went, what? I went, yeah, you probably would. You're a big lad. You probably, yeah, you'd rip me head off. And he just went, oh, right, okay, walked off. And then Louis had to go and pull him. And Addy like went, I'll tell him I didn't mean it. I got got wound up and this and that. But I have to admit, I was sat in my house looking out the window thinking, fucking Addy going to turn up in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was a, a good game, a good memory. <laughs> Brilliant. So you had an amazing four years with Preston and I know we've sort of spoke a little bit about it, but you did rupture your Achilles tendon in a pre-match game, weren't it? I think it was in the warm-up. Yes, uh, in the warm-up. But it's, well, it says that you was coming back towards August, but the schedule should have been all the way back in December. So how did you get back to fitness sort of such a quick rate? Was it more sort of routine and sort of the strength uh, strength training or was it sort of the way your mentality were to get back playing football um, I think it was a little little bit of both really I mean we got we had Matt Jackson who was the assistant at the time he was the physio um, we had uh, Radcliffe as, as well who went to Man United um, as uh, he was at Southampton they went Man United he was involved with the Wales set up as well um, he was there as well so I mean I had decent Good, good physios there. But I remember it's so boring, the re- rehab from an Achilles injury. It's like so many weeks of literally your foot in a, a plaster cast, can't move it, just got to sit and watch TV. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they take it off and then you like push your, try and push your toes against the wall because you, you lose all the strength in your, in your calf and everything. Mm-hmm. So it literally starts out just pushing against things. Uh, and then it gets to a stage where, right, you can get off the crutches. You can walk, mm. try and walk. Well, I don't know if you've ever been to Preston's old training ground. I doubt you probably have. But it was Springfield. And it was a little bit up, uphill. Mm. I couldn't drive at the time. My wife said, I'll come and pick you up. And um, it felt like I'd never walked before. I, I, it was it was horrendous. I felt embarrassed the way I was walking. Because... Mm. I couldn't push off that foot. I was just like so slow. And it was just like, <laughs> it was demoralizing. I hated it. Um, but then they said, we just need to do it more and more. So go and make a cup of tea. When you're making a cup of tea, try and lift yourself up on your foot. Mm-hmm. Go and cut the lawn. So I used to get the yeah. lawnmower and walk around behind the lawnmower with it. Um, but yeah, it, it, it was hard. It was really tough coming back. Um, but then it got to the point where I could start jumping and things like that yeah. and I had to jump off of a box onto the floor and the physio, the physio didn't tell me at the time but he was like a lot of people wouldn't have done it mm. but, but I just just jumped off it and landed on it um, and it was fine but what he didn't know was <laughs> during uh, one of my days off we'd had a party at the house and one of the balls had gone in the ditch just the other side of our garden and I jumped down onto what was a um, a pallet, you know, like a wooden pallet yeah. that someone had put in the ditch. <laughs> and it had been there for, must have been ages and it was rotten. And when I jumped oh. on it, I went I went through it. <laughs> so I'd already jumped and tested me uh me <laughs> ankle. <laughs> so when he said jump off that box, I was like, yeah, I'll be fine. I've done it once before, it'll be all right. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I I just wanted to get back playing. So anything they told me to do, I just did it. Um but unfortunately, there's other things as well. I got back quickly, but then I've got other problems with nerves in my legs and stuff. Mm. I think from where I've been sat for so long and um, it, it just took ages for it to get, get back to normal. Um, so I'd be training for a while and then the nerve would just go tight. They'd give me, I don't know if it was Tomasi pan, but it weren't far off it to mm. try and relax me. So I used to have to go into training and I'd sit on the bed and all the lads would go out to training and I'd look at the physio and I'd go, can I take one? And they'd go, yeah. <laughs> and I'd take it and I'd just sleep. Because I couldn't, I couldn't take it before I came to training because I wouldn't be able to drive. Yeah. So I had to take it whilst I was at training and 
basically fall asleep and then wake <laughs> up, do a bit of training, and then get back in the car and go home. It was a <laughs> that was a good yeah. day. Yeah, it was it was, it was uh, strange stuff. That makes yeah. you sleep. <laughs> definitely relaxes you. <laughs> I mean, you. You talk about that, and you see you see players come back, don't you? Like you might be out for say nine months, like using Liverpool as an example, where Van Dijk coming back when he does. Like a lot of people are saying, oh, when he's back, they'll be back to normal. But you don't know the effects that that injury might have on him mentally, like you say, other yeah. things. And could be, if he ever gets yeah. back, which I think he will because he's class, but could be another six months before he's right back at his, at his peak because there are all, all other effects that a big injury has. Yeah, it is. So there's so much involved in it. Like you said, you've got the mental side of it mm. where does he feel right to play? Then you've got the physical side where he just hasn't, he wouldn't have played football for ages. Um, and then you've also got, I remember Matty Upson did, did his ligament, mm. uh, his knee ligaments at Arsenal. And he did all the rehab, you know, strength, uh, training, weights, running, looked brilliant flying got back into training and he was like Bambi on ice yeah it, because the, 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 the training's so different it's so hard to replicate and he'd be turning and he'd be slipping or yeah. he just couldn't get himself going but eventually he did he got, he got back back to where he was but I remember watching him feeling quite sad for him because it was like at that point I'd never really had a really bad injury and to see someone who was a few years older than me and be doing well had a bad injury and then really seemed to struggle when he came back but yeah it's it's a tough one I mean I can look back now that I've finished and say that I never came back the same as I was mm. after I had that injury I'm sure there's plenty of fans who can tell you that but <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I knew it myself there was I was never a great long distance runner but believe it or not I was actually quite quick mm. over like shorter distances um, and I lost that explosiveness. I, I ne it never bothered me playing against small, sharp strikers because, like I said, I, I used to quite enjoy it. Yeah. Um, but I came back and, and, I, and I couldn't couldn't do it. And I'd come home and I'd do extra running down the road myself and try and do extra bits to try and get back. But it never never got. One of the first thing the, the surgeon said to me was, "Your calf will never be as big as the other one." Mm. doesn't matter what you do it'll never be as big and it, and it never did and it still isn't so if I wear skinny jeans which <laughs> a man of my age probably shouldn't it's, it's tight on my left calf but loose on my right one because yeah. they're just not the same sizes so um, yeah it's, it's one of them it's, you, you try to kid yourself a bit because you want to keep on playing and, I, and I'm glad I did keep on going um, there was a few times I said I wanted to pack it in after the injury because yeah. it was just so mentally tough to do but the physios were like no we're getting you through it and I'm glad they did because uh, I ended up going to different clubs and getting promoted and stuff and it was all part of the experience but um, yeah it, it could take him months to come back and even then he might not be as sharp he might not be as quick he just you, you, you won't know he'll know but whether he admits it he's, he's yeah yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> So the last thing that I wanted to touch on before we go to a little five question quiz, if that's all right, yeah. is did you have any superstitions before the game? So I know there's players who sort of like to hop onto a pitch before the game on one foot or touch the ground before. Did you have any sort of weird superstitions or routines before going out? Um, well, the weird ones. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they don't I, have to be mental. <laughs> it be no, I, I, I had little things that probably are strange when you when you think about it. Um, I'd always put my left shin pad and boot on before I put the other one on. Right. Um, I would at half time only eat the red and black wine gums. <laughs> But and they that, are the best. That wasn't, to be fair. that wasn't because they're the best ones. It was just something in me. Two, two red and two black. I don't know why. I'm getting a red card and a black eye. <laughs> <laughs> if, there were, if there were no red and black wine gums when you got in the dressing room, William, would you have said, I want fruit pastels? <laughs> would you have just said, I'm not eating any wine gums today? <laughs> no, I've never gone that far. <laughs> 
No, I was quite happy with him and Jaffa Cakes and oh, yeah. things like that. So I, I was quite happy with that. But um, <laughs> nowadays, I think they have everything you could ever want. We, we, we played Man City in an FA Cup game. And he walked into a changing room and it was like a, a buffet you'd have at like a wedding. <laughs> well, no, not a wedding, like a, a kid's, a 10 year old kid's birthday party. It was just like every sweet and cake you could think of was just just there, just the quick energy. So, um, but no, I did that. I'm trying to think what else. Warm up wise, when I got on the pitch, I always used to do a double. You know, when you jump up and bring your knees up, mm, I used yeah. to do like two or three of them. Always used to do it. To the point, even my wife noticed it and used to take the mickey. <laughs> oh, you're doing your little dance again. Where you? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think that was probably probably it. I, I don't think... I'd never wear gloves or anything like that. Um, and I'd always prefer to wear short sleeves as well, even if it was cold. But, yeah. Uh, that, that was probably it. I always think centre-back should, to be fair. I think if, you, if you're wearing long sleeve and gloves at centre-back, I fancy yeah. the answers against you. There's something going on. Yeah. I don't know. Whenever I came out, I'd see a striker with gloves on or an Under Armour top <laughs> and even leggings because I used to wear leggings every now and again. I'd think he, he don't fancy it. <laughs> I'll have the beating of him today. And nine times out of ten, you're right. Because if you, if you stood there and you're thinking about being cold, mm -hmm. then it's going to affect you. Whereas if you just go out and get on with it, you warm up within about five minutes. Yeah. You, don't, you don't feel it. Mm -hmm. So it makes me laugh now. They go on about Paul Tierney, don't they? How he's like yeah. cut, cut from different cloth because he wears short sleeves for every game. Thing. <laughs> that, that was every player when I played. It was like... <laughs> yeah. it was, someone's, yeah. someone's got a long sleeve top on. Jill was, Jill was there going, I'm snapping you today. <laughs> it all changed about 10 years ago when they started wearing them snoods, didn't they? Snoods, yeah. <laughs> Oh. Tevez brought them into fashion, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. it, 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 it all went all went strange. Yeah. You, have, you have to be a professional at Arsenal to wear gloves and, and trousers if it was snowing or the weather was cold. So we turned pro and we were like, brilliant, get the gloves out for training and that. And then they changed the rules because it went to an academy and everything was seen as bullying and you couldn't yeah. treat people differently. Yeah. Everybody just got the same stuff. So we worked to turn pro to get, you know, so, someone to clean our boots and this and that. And they changed the rules and went, no, you've got to clean your own boots. Kids aren't cleaning boots and you can wear whatever you want. They're like, we went through three years of like being treated <laughs> <laughs> second class citizens and now they're getting to <laughs> Yeah. Right, Josh, I'll let you go through the quiz. Yeah. Okay. So we do this with every guest. It's, uh, it's called the Tommy Lee Pro 5 quiz because Tommy. In the naming rights, he was the first to get five out of five. So, um, just five, five quick questions just about your career. Okay. Uh, we'll go straight into number one. You scored eight league goals in your 300, pro, 300 plus league games. Who was your first league goal against? And it oh. was when you were on, uh, on loan at Nars County. Yeah, it was um, Bristol City. It was, yeah. Three, two. And I've only ever seen it once. Have you? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I pulled my hamstring as I hit the shot. <laughs> uh, I, I, went, I went straight down the tunnel behind the goal at Ashton Gate. Pulled my hamstring and went straight off the pitch. You know you've got when you fold your hammy. That's what happens when you run from inside your own half as a centre back in open play. Brilliant goal it was as well. Outside my right foot, in off the post. Pulled my hamstring. So, uh, yeah, I'll never forget that one. <laughs> Let's try and dig that one out. <laughs> uh, uh, number two, you received four red cards in your career in England. I'll say that because <laughs> was the one in Belgium as well? There was. It was horrendous. <laughs> it was the worst red card you've ever seen. But that's, that, that summed up my time in Belgium. But, yeah. <laughs> so, your four red cards in England, can you remember who they were again? And I can, I can help you with who they're for if you're struggling. Um, one was against Rotherham. Yeah, the Carlin oh, Cup game for Carlin, Carlin Cup game. Yeah. Um, one was against Port Vale. Yeah. Two yellow, two yellow cards. Um, yeah. For Colchester as well in the league. Oh. <laughs> this is terrible. Let me see. <laughs> oh. Red card at Wolves. Yeah. 
Colin Cook. That yeah. wasn't a red card either. Was it um, that? <laughs> <laughs> who was the other one? Uh, who was it against? That's the question. Oh, sorry. Who was it? For? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was for Telford in the conference. Um, no, I couldn't tell you. Who was it? At Mansfield Town, 2 2 draw. Did I get sent off in that game? You did. <laughs> <laughs> I double checked. Well, you, yeah, you definitely did. <laughs> I, 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 to be honest, I don't even remember getting sent off in that. Well, there you go. I've learned something new there. <laughs> <laughs> um, number three, um, which teammate have you made the most appearances alongside? Is it. Chris Sedgwick, Sam Stockley, or Greg Halford? I'd say it was Sedgwick. Chris Sedgwick. Uh, Chris Sedgwick was 94, Greg Halford 84, Sam Stockley 96. Sam Stockley by a couple. Yeah, yeah, no, I was on, I was on loan there, two years there, yeah. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> it was close, a, a lot with uh, with Chris Sedgwick. Um, right, number four, who was your favourite opponent? And by that, I mean, which team did you win the most games against? It's a, a choice of three, three uh, Yorkshire clubs, Rotherham United, Sheffield Wednesday, or Barnsley. I've made them difficult this week, I'm sorry. Hey, mate, bloody hell, that's a tough one. It's <laughs> I would think it's between Barnsley and Sheffield Wednesday. It is between Barnsley and Sheffield Wednesday. Wait, it's 50 50. Do you know what? I, I, I can't even remember losing to Sheffield Wednesday, so I'm going to say that. It was Sheffield Wednesday. Six, <laughs> six times you beat him. I think it was six wins and three draws, I think, in nine games. So, yeah. Not, not but, a bad uh, record. It was always. They were a club that I always liked playing against because of their stadium. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So whenever you went, whenever you went there, it was always nice, big pitch, loads of fans. Um, it, it was one of the, it probably worked against them playing there. Um, but yeah, I always used to enjoy playing against them. Yeah, they're a bit of a sleeping giant as well, aren't they? Need to. Yeah, be. a bit big, big, big club, aren't they? Yeah. There's a lot of them. <laughs> a lot of sleeping giants now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and final question, question five. Which manager did you make the most appearances for? I'd say that was Phil Parkinson. Yes, correct. 112 appearances. Um, well done. Um, which manager did, did you... Was, was he your favourite, Phil? Um, I enjoyed, enjoyed it. At Colchester with him, yeah. I mean, like I said, he, he, weren't, he, he was quite a good coach. Defensively, yeah. he was good. Um, I didn't mind Paul Simpson. Paul Simpson got a lot of stick at Preston, but I thought he was all right. Um, Irvine was a brilliant coach. Very good coach. Was a good manager, but yeah. not, as good as he, not as good as he was as a coach. Yeah. Um, I didn't mind playing playing under uh, who did we have? Mickey Adams. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was uh, he was a good manager. I, well, I, I enjoyed playing under him yeah. uh, at Port Vale. But no, I'd uh, like I said I enjoyed playing at, at Colchester. So um, yeah, I'd probably say probably say Parky. Yeah. yeah. And just to flip it, I'll not go and ask for details. But is there any managers that you you didn't like playing under? Yeah, plenty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got a list. <laughs> um, number one would be Mad Dog, Martin Allen. Yeah. Two weeks in a row, we've had his name crop up, isn't it? <laughs> the, the, the man was absolutely off his head. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know whether he played up to it a bit, uh, in all honesty. Yeah. Um, but. It's not not very often you go on a trip at an end of the season, and it's the manager who gets complaints at the club <laughs> from, from from the public who saw him. Um, but yeah, me and him didn't 
didn't particularly see eye to eye. No. Uh, yeah, he um, he made my life very difficult when I was at Notts County. Yeah. He, uh, he he tried to try to do me for breach of contract. Try tried to. Um, I actually lived in Nottingham when I first joined. Uh, we had about five managers in a season, and um, I wasn't playing. I, I hadn't done well when I joined. I wasn't fit. I got injured. Um, fans didn't like me at the time. So it got to Christmas and I thought, you know what, I'm going back home. Mm. Um, and there was me and a couple of other lads. Ben Burgess lived in Blackpool. John Harley lived in Orton, like near Ormskirk. And I lived just down the road from him. So we were like, we'll all drive together. We'll, we'll meet up and take him to And And uh, he, he took over uh, Martin Allen. And... He just didn't want us. He, he, he pulled us in and basically said, if, if you can find a club, you can leave. And I was like, right, okay. So did, looked to try and find a club. None of us could get out. And um, he just, yeah, treated us horrendously, like training with the kids. Um, it would get to like a Friday, they'd need 11 v 11 for team shape. And he'd call the kids over and someone got injured, so no one else but me. And I went to join in. And he shouted about, what, what the fuck is he coming over it for? Don't want him. So I think they used a member of staff or something. Um, he, he tried to get all three of us to sign something to say we refused to live in Nottingham, which would have then meant he could have done us for like a breach of contract because there's, there's a clause in the contract about yeah. being offered suitable accommodation or something like that. Yeah. Um, we actually rang up the PFA. The PFA rang the club or rang him and said, we know what you're trying to do. <laughs> and if you do it, we'll take you to court. Right. So, um, yeah, I trained with the kids. He'd have me in on Saturdays to do press-ups and run for five minutes down the Trent next to the river uh, and then drive home. So that's like yeah. three three-hour round journey <laughs> for 10, yeah. 15 minutes. Um but yeah, he, he was a strange, strange one. He sent, sent me out on loan and I did well at Port Vale, came back and he had to play me. <laughs> and we started winning and it, it killed him, absolutely <laughs> killed him. And I said to the lads, first game we lose, I'll get dropped again. And we mm. did, we lost and he dropped me. And then they lost again and he put me back in and we ended up winning. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he was always one, like one game away from getting sacked and eventually he got sacked at Hartlepool. We got beat there, but... He used to bring his dog in. His dog had shit on the first team pitch at Meadow Lane and the ground would have to pick it up. The dog had pissed yeah. in like in the corner of the rooms and stuff. Oh. Um, he called me in for a conversation one day <laughs> and he said, do you think I've treated you badly? <laughs> and I said, yeah. I said, you won't, you won't let me train with you. You won't let me into team meetings. You won't tell me the squad. It's like you think I'm going to try and stitch you up or something. He said, yeah, I, I'll use this language. I don't know if I'm allowed to. Yeah, um, yeah. Trust he me. said, <laughs> you can. All right, I think I might have treated you like, like a cunt. <laughs> he said, do you think so? And I went, yeah, you treated me like a cunt. <laughs> right, um, well, I don't want to talk in the office. He said, because I think they're bugging it. Oh, I think the board of directors are bugging me off. Oh, what? And what? I just looked Who's at him. Who's there? Like, All right, Martin, I'm off. <laughs> Who's there, the PFA? Who's, yeah. who's yeah. bugging you off? <laughs> oh, yeah. mad. Yeah. I want to get Dennis Ray and Wesley on one episode together. <laughs> but it's a, oh. it's a competition to yeah. find out who's the most crazy. I, I heard stories about him because obviously I knew lads at Preston. <laughs> And uh, yeah, he, uh, there were some stories come out and then we played them when I was at Port Vale and we beat them. And Tom Pope yeah. got asked a question in a paper, I think it was, and they said, would you ever play for Grant Wesley? And he said, from what I've heard, there wouldn't be enough money in the world to make me play for Grant Wesley. He got a phone call from his agent saying they'd received a letter or a phone call from Wesley's lawyer saying he was going to try and if he said it again or didn't retract the comment he would do it for defamation of character <laughs> at, at the time I was doing law I was studying law so I pulled Pope and said mate it's your opinion you can say what you want 
I said, I can't do the defamation count because you said, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, so he was like, oh, well, this is just ridiculous. I was like, just, just forget about it. But I, don't, I think he's done that to other people. I think he's threatened other people. Yeah. Someone started just, me, man. Yeah, Scott Laird on, obviously, at Ex Preston. Um, yeah. And he, he liked him because he had him from Stevenage. But who yeah. were the other? Mark O'Brien, we had on. Mark O'Brien. Yeah. And again, liked him because he did well at Newport. But some of the stuff we were being told, it's just <laughs> insanity. He, I don't know if you've watched it, but with Scott Laird, he said that he, <clears throat> he put a Sabutio table up in the dressing room <laughs> and all players came in. And they were like, oh, what's this doing here? So, you know, playing around. And then Wesley storms in and he said, this uh, this is the team that you're playing today. And they're good. They're good on the ball. They're decent. And then he puts <laughs> his hand behind a whiteboard and pulls out a, tr- a toy tractor and goes, and what you need to do is fucking run them over. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, he's a strange guy. Did did. did. Did the lad say about the time he wrestled somebody in the changing room at Hillsborough? No. No, that, no. He, he had like his right hand man as well, didn't he? I, I don't know what his name was. Um, Dino. Was quite, yeah, Dino has him. Quite yeah. a big fella. And they went after one of the centre halves in the changing room, like tried to, to wrestle him in the changing room. And apparently he managed to pin one of them, like Wesley or Dino. And he showed him up a bit and he got up sort of. So oh, I was only joking. That's the reaction I wanted from you, and this and that. And I was like, he's, he's absolutely off his head. Why would you want to start fighting your players before a game? It's just like, I don't know. The, the mentality is just, just crazy. So I'm, I'm quite glad I, I was gone. I've never, never got that opportunity. <laughs> I'll probably get a phone call now saying that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't think so, anything beats the wilder story, does it, does it Luke? Yeah. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Forgot yeah. about that. Was that. I'll let you tell it. Go on, it's funny. Um, that was Scott, Scott Laird, wasn't it, as well? Yeah. yeah. And he said that um, whenever they were playing Northampton, obviously, where Wilder were managing them before he went on to Sheffield United and everything. But in the run up to the game, so like, let's say the week prior, every day <laughs> leading up to the game, at random times of the night, three o'clock in the morning and everything, Graham Wesley would be ringing him up and going, Wilder, <laughs> and just hanging up. <laughs> yeah, didn't want Wilder collared him as well after the game saying, You ever ring my fucking phone again at night? <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, yeah, I love doing this because it's so much stories that we hear. <laughs> amazing. Liam, thank you so much for giving us your time, mate. You've been an absolute pleasure. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I hope you keep well and best of luck. No, thank, thank you. I enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you for no your time. Cheers, Liam. Thanks, mate. Yeah. Look after See yourself, you mate. You Cheers. too. Cheers. Bye, Pie and a pint. Pie and a pint. Pie and a pint.